Good morning. Today we celebrate the beginning of the church year and the beginning of Advent, a time in which we anticipate the coming of Jesus Christ. Advent is a time of waiting and preparing. It asks us to consider what is it we hope for? Where is Jesus in my life? What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? Let us join together on this journey as we discover the meaning of God becoming human. I invite you to turn to the announcements found on the back of your bulletin. Many things happening in the life of the church this time of the year, and so I'm just going to highlight a few of them. Uh, Christmas cheer boxes are being packed on December 18th, and delivery is on December 20th. So if you want to help out with that, then please um, take note of that. And you can always contact or talk to Evelyn if you'd like some more information. Um, on Tuesday, that's this Tuesday, December 3rd at noon, all the women of con the congregation are invited to join the UCW for their Christmas dinner. And so please come out and participate in that. And on Sunday, December 15th at 4 p.m. is our Stories and Songs of Christmas. That's our Lessons and Carols with the Choir. And so we invite you to come and join us with that. And once again, the offering from that concert will go to the food bank and to our benevolent fund. If you haven't already gotten your December copy of our newsletter calendar, then I invite you to pick it up. Many other happenings and things going on in there. A uh, couple things that I don't think are in either, and that is that there are some new Advent books in our library, and so I invite you to check that out, out by the kitchen there, and sign out any books that you're interested in as well. Many of you have already discovered this morning that our 2020 offering envelopes are available. I just encourage you to check that out at the back of the sanctuary here and take yours home. Beth. Ah, good morning. <laughs> I'm still over the moon on the response to our carol sing on Friday night. In spite of bad weather and other events going on, it's the season, approximately 90 people came out to celebrate our, our event. The M&S committee would like to thank all the ladies who made cookies, all those who attended, Olivia the hot chocolate lady, Jean Thompson, who was everywhere, <laughs> and uh, all those who set up and tore down, Jeannie Milner and the choir who attended, uh, the fellas, and our star course with Jim Scopey, who entertained us with carols and Christmas songs and a few other favorites as well. After expenses, a free will offering of $560 was realized for the MS, and we <laughs> And we thank you, but please remember in this season of giving that this is the means for our United Church to help in this country and all over the world. Thank you again. Thank you. We offer a thank you to Beth as well for organizing that event for us. How wonderful. And it is a birthday box day. And so if you have celebrated a birthday in November, or if you're going to be celebrating a birthday in December, I invite you to come forward and drop some change into our birthday box. So I see Sandy Fairbanks and Charles <laughs> and Vera. And is that Beatrice? And Ron? 
Oh, Mark, Kathy. Oh, goodness, A lot of birthdays here. <laughs> How wonderful. So as we celebrate those that have already had a birthday and those who have birthdays up and coming, let us sing happy birthday. to have so many people celebrating this day. As we gather, we remember that we live and work on the historic lands of the Mi'kmaq. May we live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with its peoples. I'm happy to invite uh, Keith family to come forward and they're going to light our first advent candle for us. In this advent season, of expectant waiting. So many marvels, so much unique and rich, so many things to touch, taste, smell, see and hear. Thank you. Look at the variety of life. Look at how things are connected together. All to the we are brimming with wonder at God's abundance, blessing creating transformation within us. Let us pray. Ever present God, once again we begin our hopeful journey to Bethlehem. We reflect back over many years, our own as well as those of our ancestors, searching for the stories of how each generation has experienced your hope, love, joy, and peace. As we begin the waiting time of Advent, we pray that your spirit will fill us with the confident expectation that your promises will illuminate us and encourage us to spread your light in our hurting world. Amen. Let us join in singing together. Voices United, number two, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
I invite you to turn to your neighbor and to greet them, offering the peace of Christ. Well, welcome. We're missing at least one of my children. Okay. Went to the washroom. Went to the washroom. I guess that's allowed. So we've got um, Isabel and we've got Julia and Allison and Willow and Tori and Kieran and Marie Catherine somewhere wandering the building. So, that's okay. Yeah, we've got some people missing, but we're still a good group, right? Yeah. So last year, you might remember that we followed our shepherd on the search. Looks like this. And we named him Michael. And this year, he's on the search again, but he's got a new traveler with him. He's got a camel named Casey. Yeah, boy. Can you go get him for me, Tori? There he is. So each week we're going to have to find Michael, Michael and Casey <laughs> somewhere in the church as they journey towards Bethlehem and the baby Jesus whom they will find on Christmas Eve. So there they are. Wonderful. Didn't we have the camel last year? No camel last year. So what is he going to have next year? I don't know. This year he's traveling in style. He's going a little faster. See how nice that is? <laughs> so he's going to teach us a lesson each week too. So this is what Michael says. Most of the time, shepherds spend their days out in the country. That's where the munchy green grass is. And that's what our hungry sheep like. Can you imagine if I led my flock right through the middle of a busy town? The people wouldn't like that, and neither would my sheep. Towns are for people, not sheep. Lots of things happen in towns. Did you know that Jesus was born in a small town? Yes. You did? Yes. What town? Bethlehem. That's right, in Bethlehem. Yes. After the great big announcement, we heard from the angels, 
and I was surprised to see how small Bethlehem really was. It's pretty special that someone as great as Jesus could come from a place so small. That just shows how amazing God is, don't you think? I guess it doesn't matter where you're from, because God can still do great things through you. The way that Jesus came tells us a lot about God. He came in a very humble way from a very humble place. Yet he did great big things. Have you ever thought about your hometown? How many people live here? How many people do you think, Isabel? Um, I think about... 89 people? More. more than 80. I think we've got more than 89 people here today in worship. Like in, the town <laughs> in this town altogether. How many, Willow? 10,000, is that we were conferring there? Was that what we agreed? <laughs> about that, about 10,000. I think that's right. I don't have the exact number, but that sounds about right. So we're not a really small town, but we're also not a big city for sure, are we? But we do have a lot of people for the size of our town. We have a pretty good sized town, yeah. Yeah, it's comfortable, right? It's nice. Has anything really important ever happened here? Well, yeah, we celebrate the same holidays as everybody else. Has anything really important ever happened here? That's right. What? We had four of the Fathers of Confederation came from Amherst. So the Fathers of Confederation were the guys that came together and met and decided that Canada would become a country separate from Great Britain or England. What else? Mm hmm is that a well it's a little different than what I was thinking but I hear what you say <laughs> lots of important things happen in in individuals lives for sure we also were the site of a POW camp right so we were celebrating celebrating maybe isn't the right word we were marking the anniversary of that this summer so that's kind of different not every town can say that they had a POW camp that's something that makes us different. Um, have we ever had famous people come from Amherst? Can you name a famous person? That's right, Rocky Johnson. So The Rock, wrestling fame and movie fame now, his dad came from Amherst. And that's pretty cool, I think. <laughs> I didn't know that until this summer. <laughs> So who else? Someone else famous came from Amherst. So we've got the four fathers. Will Arbird. Right, Will Arbird. The author comes from Amherst. There we go. Anybody else? Who's that? Is this, I can't, I couldn't hear the name. Is that, that's Covert? Coville, sorry. Yes, who was a member of our congregation, yes. So an artist, for sure. Singer Leslie Feist is from here, if you like singers and sort of um, alternative folk music. And there is a famous world-renowned sculptor, John Greer, is from here. And I would also mention Deanne Fitzpatrick, who is very well known as our local rug hooker and artist, who... Can we think of others? Ben and Tracy Pittman. What are they famous for? They're artists as well, yes, thank you. Okay, you got to tell me who Bill Riley is. Hockey player, yes. Okay, so many artists and some hockey players and athletes and singers. 
So lots of people. We maybe don't know those names, but it's interesting to think about and to learn that there are people that, come, that have come from Amherst who are known all over the world. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I think that's pretty cool. So the point of us learning about some of those people is to realize that even though we come from a small community in Nova Scotia, that doesn't mean that we can't do anything we want and that we can't um, be the best or one of the best <laughs> in our field or in our artistry in the world. So that's pretty cool to think, right? That you can do anything, you can reach for the stars and it might happen. And that's what we're celebrating today is hope. So you can have hope for the future that you can be and do whatever you want. Let's pray. Can you repeat after me? Dear Jesus, thank you for the way you came to earth, coming to a small town, but to do great things. Help us learn to trust you to do big things through us too. Amen. Well, thank you for joining with me today. Next week, we'll be on the lookout again for Michael and Casey. Head off to Sunday school, and the rest of us are going to sing together hymn number 15, Came He Not in Fire. With the, mesh, with the focus on hope this morning, I'm going to be reading from Isaiah chapter 2. And in those days, hope was ever as important as it is for us today. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills all the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples, that they beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. <clears throat> and from the New Testament, a motivational 
challenge for all of us. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Hear the word of God from ages past. Our Gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 to 44. But about that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before, the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in which part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. Amen. 
Hear the story of God's great love for us. Let us join together in singing Voices United number four, God of all places. Let us pray. God of hope, we wait, await the coming of Christ. Help us to prepare ourselves and be ready for your arrival amongst us, even as we know your presence in this moment. Amen. The Christmas season, the four weeks of Advent, is a time for waiting. We wait for Jesus. We wait to see family and friends. We wait for Santa, or at least the joy of playing Santa. We wait to open gifts and to watch others aglow with love and appreciation. The hope found in the passages from Isaiah and Matthew is that our waiting will soon end. Jesus' birth will change the world and fulfill many of our hopes for ourselves and for our world. In his words, Isaiah captures the people's hope after they've gone through the troubling times of war, conflict, and worshiping of other gods. These passages are words of redemption and peace as the people await a leader who will be an alternative to the violent and oppressive rulers of the time. They await a time when all the people will come to know God's glory. Isaiah says, many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. Hope is restored to the people of Judah and renewed for us today. 
This passage has been quoted many times throughout our history in order to reestablish hope for the possibility of ending violence and warring. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war any more. General Council staff member Adele Halliday says, Growing up in an urban environment, I didn't have a good sense of a plowshare. I had a better sense of what a pruning hook might be. We often used pruning shears to trim plants and vegetables in the backyard garden, and I could somewhat picture what a pruning hook was, that it would have a similar purpose to pruning shears. When I first heard Isaiah 2 during an Advent worship service, I had to use my imagination. I imagined that a pruning hook would be used to help plants and vegetables grow. I imagined that it would be used to help cultivate life. This was contrasted with my mind's eye picture of a sword, a weapon that I felt was used for war and violence, death and destruction, and that would only bring pain and heartache to the one who was unfortunate enough to encounter it being wielded by another. It represented the opposite of peace. A Canadian ecumenical organization inspired by this same biblical passage gleaned its name and vision from Isaiah. From the ancient biblical vision in the book of Isaiah in which the material and human wealth consumed by military preparations are transformed into resources for human development, thereby removing the roots of war itself. Project Plowshares is part of the Canadian Council of Churches and focuses its work on peace and nonviolent action. Its vision is that war can be avoided, that use of force in national and international relations is to be minimized, that conflict is to be resolved in the interests of justice and without resorting to violence that the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons cannot be justified under any circumstances and are contrary to the will of God. Project Plowshares has articulated the biblical foundations for its work and the organization works on a wide range of peace issues such as nuclear disarmament, ballistic missile defense, the arms trade, space security, and Canadian security spending. But they know that peace is complex. So it might be part of the solution, but it's only a part, Project Plowshares. For Advent is about waiting for the coming, the coming of Jesus, the coming of peace, the coming of restored hope. We hope that God will come to a people divided and a land in turmoil to bring us forgiveness and wholeness helping us to hammer on our swords and spears as we work to make plowshares. I like that image of Adele again, that the plowshares are that what cultivates life. It's a good reference. Before our recent election, I thought that we Canadians we're avoiding following our neighbors to the south down the road of strong divisions along political party lines. 
said that was before the election, right? But unfortunately, many of the same issues and frictions have bled over the border, fueled by social media, sensationalized news, and playing into fears on all sides. Hmm. I don't know about you, but I feel a little manipulated. That's kind of how I feel. Like my feelings and my interests have been manipulated into this thing that has bred conflict and friction. But if we truly have faith, and if we live in hope, acting with love, then we wouldn't fall into these traps, but rather be assured that all will be well. Now we can all stamp our feet and get angry that no one listens to us. I'm sure we've all had moments like that, whether that's in our personal lives or whether that's political. <laughs> Or perhaps rather than stamping our feet and getting upset, we could actually listen to the needs of our neighbors just as Jesus taught us to. I don't have the answers. I'm not a politician, just in case you thought that was what I was going to offer you today. <laughs> um, and I know, like the statement of project plowshares that it is not simple what will unify our nation is likely not a simple answer but it is a complex series of issues and yet I do wonder if we could be as simple as to just think truly think and listen about the needs of our neighbors would we be so angry Hmm. I sometimes wonder, what would Jesus think if he returned tomorrow? Well, hell, if he just came on December 24th. Would he be proud of our progress as a human race? Perhaps he would wonder why we still fight so much and love so little. Or maybe he would be amazed that we've managed to keep faith and remain faithful all these many years. I don't know when or if Jesus will ever return, but I live in that hope because I know that our world is still in need of much transformation. When Jesus comes, may he find us hard at work, hammering our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. May we be prepared as we hope that Jesus will come alive within each one of us this season. We do not know when or where this miracle of faith will occur, and yet we expectantly wait, prepared for its arrival. So though God may not take on flesh once again, at least not in that same way as Jesus Christ so many years ago, but God does take on flesh in each one of us. I'm reminded of John Wesley, the father of Methodism, who speaks about his conversion experience. And it's interesting to call it a conversion experience, perhaps because he was already teaching and preaching and being a messenger of God in so many ways. But he didn't feel like he fully embodied the Christ light until one evening after a long two and a half hour sermon that he offered to the gathered crowd, be happy I don't preach that long, he went away and he felt a change within himself that he describes as his heart strangely being warmed. 
Reminds me a little bit of that children's story by Dr. Seuss too and the Grinch and how his heart grew three sizes bigger. That's one of the things that we might live in hope for this Advent season is being truly changed and truly experiencing a connection with the Christ light within. A light that is always there, but sometimes we just aren't quite connected with it. Be ready, be prepared, for it will come at an unexpected hour. Thanks be to God for the gift of hope that we all receive through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We give to demonstrate our desire to know the Christ child who comes to transform us and our world. Let us stand and sing together as the offering is brought forward. You may have noticed that we've also brought forward three baskets full of scarves and mitts and hats given to our mitten line. And so we give thanks for those as well as they make their way to be included in the, um, uh, it's not toys for tots, Christmas for kids. Thank you. Did I get that right? <laughs> Let us pray. God of hope, as we present our Advent gifts of time, talent, and treasures, enable us with humility to liberate our prophetic spirit and to dream, to hope, to wait for your coming. Amen. We come before the Lord our God in prayer. God of new awakenings, daily we are asked to make tough choices that affect everything and everyone around us. It is hard to protect ourselves and loved ones from situations we neither know nor understand. How can we prepare for the unexpected? How can we know what can only be described as mystery? How can we wait for a visitor that is already among us and within us? Awaken in us, God, the light of Christ and lighten the paths that we cannot find on our own paths of healing for those who are ill, paths of wisdom for those burdened by difficult decisions or situations, paths of rest for those wrestling with uncertainty. This day we pray especially that your light of love be with 
your people, Rod and Richard, Lou, the folks of Gables and Centennial Villa, the victims and those affected by terror attacks in London and New Orleans. Grant us the courage to avoid quick fixes and easy answers. And grant us the courage to choose to wait for your wisdom, peace, and hope illuminating our path to you. We join these prayers together in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 29, Hark the Glad Sound. We go and await the Holy Child. God comes to dwell within us, bringing hope to humankind. God is with us, this we know. Come spread hope wherever we go. Amen. Amen.